Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, who is at present abroad and chiming in to introduce you to the episode that I'm publishing while abroad that I recorded before I went abroad with Justin Wells, who's a documentary filmmaker and a uh, cinematographer and a cameraman. And he's also working on an exploration of archetypes of storytelling on his YouTube channel, which is linked below, which I find absolutely fascinating. Very nuanced. It's not just a paint by numbers breakdown of story structure. There's a lot of room for creativity in there. And in this conversation, we talk about these various different archetypes and we apply it to my work as a documentarian, uh, an interviewer, and the work that I did on the Evergreen State College story. So I found this very fascinating. I'm in a bar right now, so I'm going to let you go so you can listen to me and Justin speak about all things story. I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to see where we go. I'm sorry, I have to apologize, though, because I'm, this is a rare time that I'm speaking with a filmmaker and my professional grade camera is already packed up because I'm heading out to out of the country tonight so it's just going to be low low fi on my end for the video wow. portion at least but we get to see you in crystal clear every single pore available to the eyes hd with a nice bokeh background yeah. are you in a wee space or is this your uh, home studio it's very studio-esque yeah this is uh justin wells studios <laughs> nice <laughs> i have you know a live work loft in uh in pasadena here so oh. i can film here i can kind of do do all my stuff i got to um, I, I was going to do a shoot, uh, a guy wanted to do a lecture here. And so I got this vintage chalkboard, you know, kind of like a cool black chalk <laughs> chalkboard. And then the guy canceled. So okay. I, I have a chalkboard in here now, so I can, I can do whatever. I, I never used it though. Oh, really? Well, uh, yeah, you could start, uh, you, you could start riff on whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. a lot of your work is kind of diagrammatical. The way that you're mm -hmm. charting uh, plot arcs yeah. and um, the yeah. different kinds of stories and stuff, which is uh, where I got my start. And well, I mean, what led to me doing the work that I'm doing now was uh, studying narrative arts at uh, college, and then. Okay, so so you're. I think we may have similar backgrounds. My dad was a pastor. Yours was a pastor, right? Yeah. What yeah. what denomination was it? Well, um, kind of like evangelical, uh, kind of the evangelical set. He calls himself a Trinitarian now, uh, but it was kind of right. like evangelical, a little bit of Pentecostal towards the, uh, as I grew up and he matured and kind of toned down uh, the kind of the dog, dogmatic or, or the intensity mm -hmm. of, of the worship and, uh, you know, became more contemplative. Right. So right. now he's just retired and reading and stuff. And what kind of uh, pastor dad did you have? <laughs> Similar. It was, yeah, evangelical, non-denominational, you know, um, charismatic. Um, and, uh, you know, I went on this major intellectual journey after that, going to study philosophy and, yeah. you know, theology and, and stuff, you know. So, but I feel like you probably had a similar journey to me. I, I think that um, that there's something about having a dad who whose job is to talk and to talk about things meaningful things you know um it lends itself to there's a lot of filmmaker friends that i have that are uh you know that were that grew up with in in pastor families like whatever you might call that um really you know i think it's a it's like a, a muscle a skill you know for uh, talking and working with ideas and and that sort of thing you know yeah. so and finding anecdotes to illustrate the ideas and vice versa right pulling ideas and, out and of so, anecdotes what was your you said you studied narrative in yeah. was what was your major uh evergreen doesn't have majors so i created a major called narrative arts which was a amalgamation of uh theory and practice uh, so i read a mm -hmm. lot of um i read and i wrote a lot of um academic stuff but i had already done a lot more uh work before i went to evergreen i just went to evergreen for accreditation and to get connected um but what i got connected to was a completely different thing than i had uh, imagined and uh and lo and behold the entire uh storytelling industry at least on the print version is uh kowtowing to uh this thing that everybody's tired of calling woke but i'll just use mm -hmm. the word woke right now um but i i really enjoyed i tried to get to a 
to the place where critical theory branched off from an earlier form of hermeneutics and one theor theoretician or hermeneute that I got a lot out of was Paul Ricoeur, who is a mm -hmm. French uh, guy and his books are like impossible to read, but he's dealing with all these different ideas. And he gave me the idea of a constructive mode of, of sem semantic analysis rather than a deconstructive mode of mm. sem semantic analysis. And I, I used that to try to figure out a story that I'd been trying to tell for about uh, 20 years right now, which is a, a story about stories, um, you know, uh, hyper metafiction. Um, and I could, really? I, I kept on writing all these uh, stories, but when they would always collapse upon themselves, but I can never survive that metafiction. It, the stories kept on crashing mm -hmm. through the metafiction and I kind of finally figured it out. Um, towards the well, end what do you mean by metafiction? Well, uh, so, um, so the postmodern turn in literature is that self-awareness and then using modes of interpretation to comment on the story and then the swallowing or the, the combating of, well, not combating. It depends on how you do it. But if you think of one conception of postmodernism within literature is that we are at the end of forms. And so we're standing outside of forms. We see all these different forms. We see mythology. We see all these different narratives, but we can't really totally uh, believe in any given one. We're kind of in between or outside of any given narrative. And that in and of itself is a narrative, which only ever results in a, a spiral of self-criticism or, or abdic, abdic abdignation of storytelling of, of the truth and the meaning and the power of storytelling, because it's a highly cynical, um, kind of endeavor. Um, so trying to get through that, use that as a way not to deconstruct fiction, but to take all these different forms and genres and organize them like an orchestra. So just as an image that I used, it, you know, like the wood section would be the mythology and the brass section would be the fairy tales. And then you have, uh, you know, the romances or the, the pulp fictions, all these different kind of sets of, of instruments that have different tonalities to them, have different abilities and capacities and, and uh, emotionalities in them. If you can get them all to work together towards a common theme, then you've kind of overcome that being in between any given Mm -hmm. narrative any given you know substance yeah. or, or strain wow that's fascinating um i wonder it, it, there may be some overlap with my my project of, of trying to to map these stories you know um because you know i think that the the way i'm kind of thinking about it nowadays is that there's this kind of unconscious world like the world of our dreams the and the world of of um mythology and all of these stories have been told over and over that kind of get all of the rough edges refined off of them and that they're almost like there's almost like a map that you can kind of wander through that's the that's the you know i mean if i goes i guess you could use a, a young in term like the collective unconscious or something like that but yeah, yeah. um but it's sort of just looking at you know um the uh every day i was just reading this morning about um i, I have a friend of mine a filmmaker she made a, a movie called praying the hours and it's she <laughs> made a character based off of all of the hours that they would pray in the medieval um you know uh there's there's uh the vigil and then there's uh vespers and yeah, vespers yes. all, yeah and she created a character for each one of those you know and what i yeah. kind of learned uh, from her really was that the whole day comprises like a whole life cycle you know and so each of those prayers were designed to confront a certain reality for that season of life as well as that portion of the day like they're kind of like analogically related or fractally related you know? yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah. like like a year has a a birth and then a summer and then an autumn and then just like your life has yeah, you know, uh, um yeah 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 a winter a pride a fall and then another winter in, in modern day right right yeah yeah and so it's like okay so if if you have like a life cycle that you can attach all of these sort of ritualistic prayers to in praying the hours and if you have a year cycle that kind of also follows that mirrors that same pattern. Um, you could also map it onto a whole life, you know, from adolescence all the way through, uh, through the, your legacy, you know, and so you can go up to civilization level too. 
or even oh, yeah. organism right. level with well, the human race yes. as, as a totality of development right right yeah and so it, it's i stopped thinking of it just like like an object lesson like oh just the same as you have you know a death and a life in your in your waking life in your sleeping you know a, a death and rebirth cycle um thinking oh that's kind of a good way to think about also your whole life um i sort of now think of it as all kind of actually that's how re reality is constructed you know that's that is reality and so hmm. it's not arbitrary that you would have that the prayer of the the sunrise prayer whatever that might be relates to the first plot out of the seven basic plots you know and the last one the rebirth relates to the legacy the you know so i that's my theory i, I yeah. haven't mapped it all out i haven't confirmed it all yet but that, yeah. that's what i'm looking for is looking well, I, for connections i would i would even challenge you calling it a theory it's not a theory it's a story you're not it's not you're you're making yeah. a story out of stories right so so it's gonna have right. it's gonna cohere to the narrative that you're bringing to it like that prejudice mm -hmm. or uh in, is a negative term but that bias or that point of view that that allows you to construct something bigger than just reaction um mm -hmm. I, we can call it theory but i think that that uh undermines what you're actually building and what makes it so powerful if you do pull it off it's because you're not telling a, a theory you're telling a story and then and then mm -hmm. people place that into us and one of the one of the aspects of Ricoeur's work and I know that he's drawing from a lot of other people so I'm just going to reference him is the conception of what a narrative is like the basic conception of a narrative is that you have a character you have you have an agent and then you have an arena and then things happen between that agent and that arena now everything if you break it down to the very rudiment then you can start to build up but every time that you start to build up you start to tell a story out of it it's something emerges on top of that and that's how i think that that's the way out of the postmodern deconstruction which tries to break everything down to semiotics like just this dictionary of related terms like in a uh, derridian kind of like there's just all these opposites all these signs that are that are wrestling with each other or in tension with each other and we can break those apart but in in the dictionary that's one way of defining what language is but every time we use language we're making a semantic meaning out of the words the words kind of come to us and what we're communicating is of another order of so-called emergence is emerging on top of that and then once we start to conceptualize ourselves as agents speaking to each other we start to have a, a narrative story we start to engage on another like level or another plot and it all kind of stacks down and, and builds up kind of like a uh, kind of some sort of elevator that you can uh, look at all these modes of analysis, but breaking everything down to just deconstruction or just kind of word games or language games, you, you lose the human. Uh, you lose a lot of, the, and even if you go, every, if you abstract everything to theory, you're also kind of betraying or pretending that you're not being a human um, in a way. So, right, right. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been kind of thinking of um, my my theory of documentary film, which is what was my previous. Um, yeah. you know, project, um, is really based off, based off speech act theory, you know, the, 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 cause I, From I, Cyril? I was a, yeah. yes, but, but I don't know that much about Cyril, but I, but, yeah. um, Wittgenstein was kind of a forerunner of that. And I was always a fan of Wittgenstein and, um, but the idea that you're doing something by saying something, you know, so, yeah. so that you, you, um, you know, when it is they used to think that language is just a description of the world. And it was either true or false. It would either map onto the world or not. But yeah. Wittgenstein came along and said, well, actually, sometimes you're doing something when you say something. You're encouraging, you're commanding, you're, you're promising, praising, yeah. promising. Right, right. Denouncing. And yeah. so 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 in documentary film, that that was kind of my first like academic project was to try to figure out really what makes a documentary meaningful and good, you know. Yeah. And yeah. So What's I the realized, recipe? What's the secret recipe? <laughs> well, I, I was going to the film festival every year, and I went for like 15 years straight, and I would always go see the documentaries, and I started to review documentaries, interview documentary filmmakers. Getting, I was studying at Art Center at the time and, and focusing in documentary. Um, and, um, and I noticed that they would fit, these, these movies would fit into these sort of truth categories you know and it's okay. a selection of a certain kind of truth for a certain purpose you know and um this is a you know um Werner herzog famously said uh 
famous one of my favorite documentarians that um if you want facts then just take the phone book and you'll get a million facts but they don't mean anything they don't do anything you know so what i started to notice was that these um these films would f would would be performing a certain action such as to remember you know to to celebrate two kinds of rem remembering you know celebration yeah. and lament positive and negative you know yeah. or to um to to testify to some truth that needs to be known by the by for by the community so so a testimonial documentary is looking for testimonial truth so it's selecting those facts and like so like a testimonial story structure a, a testimonial story pattern would follow a certain structure so it's like uh, the the lines to amazing grace i once was lost and now i found i was blind okay. but now i see so then yeah. basically There's i noticed plot. that these yeah. right the the filmmaker would be looking for that pattern and looking to find it in the world you know so find someone who was lost and then a little miracle happened and now they see or now they're found you know um so like an example that i use in my class is a, a documentary called life animated which is about a this kid owen source kid source skin who was on the on the spectrum and so he couldn't speak because the world was coming at him too fast you know he couldn't process it and one day and so that's the that's the lost part i was lost you know he can't speak for all intents and purposes he's dead he, he he's yeah. not going to be able to have a life like a normal human would have and then one day this is the miracle the dad says a line from these from a disney movie because he would watch these these animated disney movies over and over and the kid says the next line and they realize oh it's not that he doesn't know how to talk it's that he can't process the real world fast enough so the 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 exaggerated um you know uh, facial expressions on the animated figures the predictability of the plot and the predictability of the dialogue yeah. made it so that they could sort of enter into that world and that was processable by his brain in some way you know and so they could they could kind of like embody a character from aladdin <laughs> and talk to him and he would talk back and then slowly it expanded out of that to where he could actually talk like normal person and by the end of the of the movie he's giving a speech in paris about the benefits of animated movies for people on the autism spectrum you know yeah yeah and so it's like that's the perfect pattern it's lost miracle found you know so then i just started looking around and I noticed, wow, like there's there's eight million of these documentaries that fit that pattern, you know, and it's it's basically I see it as like a like a creative identity. Like these these filmmakers are they've chosen that form of truth telling to be their, you know, calling their their their. Um, yeah, that's their the pattern palette. that they work in. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And so it, for my students, yeah. what I do is I say, well, maybe you're one of the, I'll just introduce them to the different ones, testimonial, celebratory, lament, um, testimonial. And I'll say, maybe this will save you a little bit of time because now you know the pattern that you're looking for out yeah. there in the world. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's really important to, uh, to understand how organization happens. So in my rebellious phase as a, as an artist, not to mention as a human being, um, I I just looked down on form. You know, I really got angry with form, got angry with the predictability of form. I didn't want to be, um, I, I just wanted to interact with, uh, you know, the innovation itself. Just like, let the story come out, let the story come out. And what that ended up doing uh, by really strictly adhering to that was that I had to relearn the whole wheel. And so it, it just set me back really far and i had to grope my way into figuring out what i was even trying to do but because i i was so frustrated i i got to focus on little tiny things or i, I developed i rounded out my development as a writer um because i betrayed story for so long or delayed actually maturing into into accepting that form is form and and um, you know it, you know getting used to that prison in a way well, it, it, there's definitely a sense that the and, and artists of all kinds of different stripes will tell you this is that that self-imposed limits are actually very freeing, you know? Yeah, so well, self-imposed, but like yeah. like the monomyth, like I just want to shake oh. my fist at that, you know, the yeah. monomyth. There's just one story, you know, to rule yeah. them all. It's like, you, Joseph Campbell, <laughs> get off my lawn, <laughs> you jerk. 
Well, one of the I think one of the reasons why that seems to kill people's creativity, trying to follow these these patterns, these yeah. story, you know, how to you know save the cat, screenwriting one hundred and one. But I call that the um, the rich dad poor dad genre of screenwriting books. You know, like the 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 self help. You can be rich if you just follow this formula kind of book marketing ploy that they have for books these days yeah there's that version of the the, of the screenwriting book or the writing book you know where it's like here's the the the, they dangle the kind of like prize of you can be rich and famous if you just follow this you know um but it's um one reason why i think maybe is is it's using the wrong side of the brain you know it's using the left brain maybe and you're saying follow this formula when um it, I, I just don't think that most yeah. writers do that. I don't think that you just have a formula and then follow it. I think you just kind of free form and then you, you it, the, it, the pattern kind of like emerges. So it's got to, you got to kind of like put the, all those patterns and stuff, like get them into your subconscious somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think that's mostly done by reading or, you know, consuming good stories. It'll kind of seep in. Yeah. And having a little bit of understanding of of how they kind of work, like understanding, you know, who's the Gandalf character and the Dumbledore character, and you know that this one character that it, that always says the same thing and always shows up at around the same time. I think it's good to know that, you know, what yeah. what does that character represent, you know, but not so good to to like say, okay, on page five this has to happen, and on page twenty this has to happen, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of your videos, you do go into different archetypes. Or actually, you do a whole series on, on different archetypes, different characters. Do they fit into some sort of hours, or how do you how do you constellate well, them? So I, I'm basically using the, you know, you're you're an experienced YouTube person, so you know I'm I'm totally new to this. I started by just putting my documentary lectures on, just to house them somewhere because in the age of COVID. Um, you get a lot of absences these days. And so I just didn't want to give them a, a badly recorded version of the live lecture when they missed the class. I wanted to just have a night, put all the video clips in and all that, you know. So I started with that. And then um, now I want to develop a course on the seven basic plots where it would be like we'd go through the seven plots and then everyone would choose one of the seven as a self-imposed limit. And then the second half of the semester would be reading every, what everyone wrote and just see, you yeah. know, does it work? to to uh to use that as a kind of a uh you know a temp like a like i think of it like blues or jazz like i'm gonna write a jazz piece here i'm gonna write a blues piece or i'm gonna write a swing piece something um so i just started going through um the the seven basic plots one at a time with long kind of lamb lectures uh, yeah. uh, on and a on lot of sources too. trying to think through it. you, you yeah. fill up with a lot of sources and and i'm just gonna I'm, i've made it up to quest you know so i did rags to riches um voyage and return overcoming the monster and i've made it up to the quest and i'm kind of in the middle of that comedy and tragedy i'm saving for later because there's a lot of history behind those rebirth is one that i really like i want to probably maybe do that one next yeah. um and i'm just trying to see put it out there in public and just kind of see how it grabs people and see if that's a good way to think about it. If it helps them actually with their creative output or not. Yeah. Um, and I also think it relates to life, you know, like, like I said, like a life cycle, you know, so you might think that, okay, the next phase in my life is going to be, you know, I just finished my overcoming the monster, you might say, and now what's next. Now it's the comedy, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. now next is the quest or whatever, you know? Um, yeah. So, well, what is quest? What what is like, like just somebody walks off? Like it doesn't sound like a well, plot. It's just like quest. Like, okay, well, the quest is the one that mo- that most closely adheres to Joseph Campbell's monomyth, you know. Okay. And and so one of the criticisms that I have of, of Joseph Campbell is that I think that he if if there's at least seven of these archetypes, which I'm getting that not from me, from other people. Um, he tried to fit all seven into that one, stuff them all into into the quest. And so there's yeah. the call and the refusal of the call and the crossing of the threshold and the meeting with the goddess and the going into the cave for the elixir and all that. And I noticed that if you're dealing with a, a rags to riches plot, it doesn't have all those elements. You know, if you're dealing with oh, okay. the monster, it doesn't have all those. Yeah. Um, but 
So I, I plotted out, um, well, well, here, it, these, this is the seven in the order that I put them in, in the life cycle. So rags to riches is first, which is, um, going from pure potential, Cinderella, Aladdin, diamond in a rough to some kind of competence in the world. So it's, it's yeah. mirroring the, the, the process of the, of, of early on in life where you have not, not accomplished anything, but you have potential. And, and your main problem is not that there's bullies that are bullying you so much or that you need to find your your legacy meaning or, you know, some one of the goals of some of these other plots. But it's just that you you haven't accomplished anything yet and nobody recognizes you for who you are, you know, and so you need to go out and, and accomplish something. So then there's always a fairy godmother, a genie figure that comes in and gives them a little bit of magic early on, which brings them right up to the top. Cinderella dances with the prince. Aladdin courts the princess. Uh, Eliza Doolittle learns how to get rid of her her uh, Cockney accent and goes to the horse races. Um, pretty woman, Rocky. You know they 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 go up to the top, and then the magic is pulled away. The clock the clock will strike midnight in some sense. Okay. Eliza Doolittle slips up, and she reveals her lowbrow accent and then she falls all the way down to the bottom so then there's is a that fall from all the way to the bottom papillion is that the uh my fair lady plot line my, my fair Eliza? lady yes okay yes yeah 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 um and and so then um they climb all the way back up to the top but without the help of the genie without the magic you know so there's a sense it's like it mirrors the training wheels you know huh. so at, at first you you get put you, training wheels on your bicycle so that you can kind of ride without falling you get a little bit of assistance from the, the previous generation you know yeah. but eventually that assistance from the previous generation your parents your guardians whoever it is they're going to have to pull away their help their protection and you're going to have to learn how to do it on your own you know and so then you climb they climb up and by the end of the plot they have learned what it, what proper you know leadership you know ruling of a, of a little kingdom uh they've they've learned yeah. the the way to do it that's not the counter example of the wicked stepmother or the evil stepsisters or you know harry potter's you know overbearing cousin or you know who <laughs> all of these they're, they're always sort of like orphans with illegitimate authorities and then they yeah. learn not to do the, what they did they learn not to to rule in a tyrannical way they learn how to rule with justice and uh, yeah and, and they own and, they own their competence they own it yes. not it's not just a gift it, it's something that they earned um right and sweated right. through yeah. yeah that actually pl plots on to um certain dynamics of a spiritual development where you can be the case uh for some people that they get a great insight or some sort of grace and they ride on that and then the grace is taken away they go through a dark night of the soul and then they they slowly come uh, are drawn back to the presence or or uh go through the go through the process where they i guess appreciate and value what what is what is grace what is gift and and what is uh and my deserve or my relationship to to the grace or, or whatever um, so there's yeah. just a lot of different or you can think about i was also thinking probably with steve jobs or jeff jeff bezos or somebody like g doing a one-hit wonder and then mm -hmm. like completely not neither of those guys exactly map onto this but maybe the napster guy did that where you get really high really quick and then you have to kind of work your way back up and do a company and stuff like uh, there's an yeah. entrepreneurial um aspect yeah. to those stories so the stories themselves they make good stories but they also um give us a sense of peace about the pattern of our lives in a way give us a sense of peace patience and, and understanding it's like okay i i went through that i needed to go through that and and that's just that that's a human thing that that rounds me out that brings me into maturity going through that's that why process. i i really like my favorite parts of these movies is always the dark night of the soul because yeah. because um it shows that whatever you're going through you the you the reader you the viewer that it's not wrong like it's not outside of the path of life you know um that that there is this um that those moments are part of life you know and so you you don't have to you know that you can either think of your life as pleasure or pain 
it's a switch on or off. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm sad. I'm happy. I'm sad, you know, but when it's embedded in a narrative that has ups and downs and you kind of know what to expect it, there's some sense in which I think the plots are telling you what to th- expect of the future. You know, you're probably going to go through this or some version of this, yeah. you know, yeah. um, so, yeah, I have a buddy who I went to grad school with that does now. Th- he's a therapist, you know, he got his Ph.D. and, and he does. Um, it's not narrative therapy, but it's something like that. It's dialectical, in, in, integrative something. therapy, integrative. OK, sure. I don't know. Something like that. I'm probably using the name wrong. All I know is how he tells me it works. But basically, the idea is that. Um, if any time you let's say you go to a cocktail party and they say hi who are you and and you you are then required to tell a narrative and that's your identity that's you, the story of you is what you're about to say in a little tiny mini form you know yeah and so if you leave out all of the dark parts or the traumatic parts you're kind of hiding that from yourself you know and so what he does in the, in the therapy is he teaches people how to integrate the dark parts into the story so that so that it's not just left out so that you're just telling some kind of a version of the story that's false um, to, to, to make yourself look better or to make people feel better, but you're putting it in a way. And, but it's also not just like you say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Your identity revolves around your failures completely. Yes. Right. So that's why it's very interesting, like in AA and stuff, they'll have people that kind of they'll lead with that, that failing. I'm an alcoholic, you know, but then it's part of a a larger story. So it kind of gets integrated in. And so it's no longer being hidden. And and when things are hidden, it kind of festers, you know, kind of, you know, when when things are in the shadow, they kind of they kind of grow, they kind of like, um, take on well they, you know, they have unexpected. impacts no matter what um and then they usually kind of come out uh in an uncontrolled manner that is rather destructive um exactly yeah. exactly yeah and so i i think what he's doing is very similar to what i'm doing just in a different medium which is to show people how to put together a narrative of their life that is that's a, that's an archetypal plot so you're embodying now one of these archetypes as your as your narrative identity. Yeah. As opposed to just thinking I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm happy, I'm sad. Yeah. And 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 that's it it it'll it'll carry you through a lot of the of the trials and tribulations of life that way. Does that work in uh the present in re- is does that work in the relationship to the future or only retrospectively? Can, can you say, like, I'm, I am the hero now? Like, can you honestly say that? I, I think it would take a certain form of honesty and deep understanding of oneself to apply that hermeneutic as a practice rather than as an interpretation of where you're from, right? Storytelling is a backward-facing thing. We want it well, to... We know yes. that it's going to repeat, but it's really difficult to project yes. onto the future. Well, you might... like. So I plot the seven basic plots on the two mountain structure, which I got from David Brooks, which is that the first half of life and the second half of life. The first half of life is is the mountain of success. And that's starting with rags to riches where you're, you're trying to accomplish something yeah. and, and and make a name for yourself and, you know, find your your other half. And, you know, all these goals that are in the first half of life. And then the second half is the mountain of legacy. And that's where you're learning how to to um Pass it on to all, everything that you got on that first mountain on to the next generation. You know, all of the value, all the insights, all the wisdom, plus the wealth. Um, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge is a perfect example of of the rebirth plot, which belongs on that mountain, the second mountain, which is when he realizes that you can't leave it behind, you know, yeah. or you, you can't take it with you, I should say. You know, all it, your wealth doesn't do you any good if you're just going to hoard it all and then die, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think that you could say, all right, let's say you're in the in your midlife period and you've had some successes. You've already done maybe an overcoming the monster plot. You've dealt with some bullies in your life. You've already done kind of a rags to riches. You 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 have a career, you have maybe a family or whatever. Well, you might be able to say the next thing for me is going to be the quest, which is the bridge between the two mountains. 
You know, okay. it's the bridge between the mountain of success and the mountain of legacy. And so maybe I'm going to start th thinking about giving back, you know, maybe. And, and, and I find this in documentaries like um, there was a documentary about Val Kilmer recently. And I said, absolutely. He's trying to get to his second mountain. That's what the whole documentary is about. He's already been successful. Now he wants to to do something that gives back and create a legacy like legacy is, a, is yeah. about things that last. So it could be a book that you want to write. You want to write your memoir. You want to do something that's not just for today, right now. You know, it could be actual offspring, like a family, grandchildren, children, um, or it could be something like teaching, mentoring. You know, um, and and so I think you could look f forward in that sense. Like I, in retrospect, look back and I saw these other plots that I did. Maybe I even have a tragedy in my past. You know, maybe I, I made mistakes and I can look back at those as tragedies. And but I can sort of look ahead now and I can say, well, maybe this maybe this is going to be my next goal. You know, every story has the protagonist has a goal, has a something that they're going for. And so so maybe you could look. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that would be helpful to people or not, you know, but um, it's a good thought experience. It's nice to um, be adept or. Uh, yeah, adapt it. This one, one quick second. Yeah. Always correcting the cats. Um, so it, you, you go through the plots, and you also mentioned something about documentaries. Um, are they related, or is documentary a different form than fiction? Essentially, um, or does it end up exploring different things in different ways or creating different patterns as an art form in and of itself? Or is it basically just adapting uh, fiction storytelling techniques to material, to facticity? Uh, well, I think they, they overlap. And I've been kind of going back and forth over how exactly to talk about the difference between the two genres. Because um, you don't want to say that the archetypes which is really what narrative fiction filmmaking is kind of getting at, I think, um, are less true than than facts, you know. Um, so I think what documentary really is about is the selection of the facts, which and the framing of them, you know, how are you going to select them? How are you going to frame them? Yeah. Um, uh, but the difference is maybe that um, you can't um, you have to you have to let it emerge in documentary. You can't you can't think, OK, I'm going to make a rags to riches documentary and then go make it one. Usually it's not that simple. It's more kind of like, well, this person is really interesting. You know, what's their story? And then you kind of yeah. it kind of will emerge as you go. So you have to be more kind of like inductive with documentary. So that's mm -hmm. why my approach to teaching documentary is more exploratory and I'm framing it more like you, the documentarian, are going on a journey on foot, which is what um, how Werner Herzog phrases it, yeah. into the unknown. And you're going to find some things and then you're going to look and see what you think they mean. You know, that's kind of the, the, the way that it works, I think. Um, yeah. So like, for example, uh, there's, you know, Ira Glass, the guy from NPR, um, he does This American Life, you know, it's been running for years. I show a little clip in my class of him talking about how he constructs a radio documentary, you know, and he he frames it in terms of the the most powerful thing is the anecdote, the 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 compelling interview example, you know, man on the street sort of thing. That's the fact. That's the that's the that's the the thing down here. But he goes, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It, it won't be compelling to people unless you connect it up to a universal or to to like a bigger point. You know. Yeah. Um, what does he call that? He calls it a point. I I remember watching this really striking little clip that you had in in one of your videos about that. But he he, he really um, stresses it. Like you can have the anecdote, but if it doesn't go anywhere, like it just fizzles out and makes me so frustrated. Yeah. He says. Um, well, yeah, it like it's, a point it's like, or. <laughs> yeah, the meaning. The the yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I. I, you, I when you're what talking about, about that, you're, yes, the aboutness of it, the yeah. meaning of it. And that's where it's connecting up, I think, to the archetypes, like in fiction huh. film, where yeah. it's kind of it's connecting to something. Now, if you don't 
like believe in arch the archetypes or you don't think about the archetypes, then you can still connect it up, but it's going to just be a lower order thing. Like it could be a political point that you're making from the anecdote. The anecdote connects up and that's to make a political point or to make a, yeah. um, a propagandist type thing. You know, yeah, or so, counter propagandist, which is another form of propaganda, anyways. <laughs> You're just right. making me think of my Evergreen documentary and how that came to be. Um, I, you know, I collected the data, I went through all the data, and and my audience watched me develop as a, you know, as as a personality while I did that. And then at some point, I just said, I have to do this. I have to put this all together. And then I just started throwing everything down, and I'd publish an episode, and then I'd do another episode, and do another episode, and I go backward and forward in time and illustrate things, and I take things from outside of evergreen to put it together and then i'd make every once in a while I'd make more commentary i need to redo the whole thing at least do all the commentary over again um but uh, you know the just trying to think did did i go to that point i even tried to i tried to stop the point halfway through the video series to say don't judge these kids don't don't look at the kids it's that. really yeah. easy look at look at what they're acting they're acting out something they're acting out something mm -hmm. um and and but the the story in and of itself there's so many different points and and so many different gaps in the story even though i call it the complete that's a complete lie it's not the complete evergreen story um yeah. so i'm i'm being kind of meta i'm kind of uh aware of the the gaps in the genre or the inability for me to um not make it make a point um or or to make it actually complete but one question that i have always had is that why didn't anybody do the same thing that i did from the other side one girl i have on film saying i'm going to make the documentary of this place and she had access to all the material that i did and i just wonder possibly if it's if the, the the pro evergreen protest side if it's even possible for them to create a coherent narrative out of the actual uh, you know the, the actual material if if the material itself stands in testament against the story that they're acting out within the narrative right um i just wonder that there's no nobody's gonna do that it doesn't seem i don't i don't see us making a hagiography of george floyd either um mm -hmm. You know, in the same way that, that they've uh, really tried to construct a narrative out of the January 6th um, thing that happened. Um, yeah. Well, see, what you were doing, I think you were doing that process because you were giving us anecdotes and the anecdotes were out of the box. You this just, happened. You, this happened. Shocking. This happened. You, you know, yeah, just things that, that like Ira Glass would say, is that those are very, they, they're grabbing. They, they, they're anecdotes that really grab you. You know, but um, you, what you were connecting it up to, I think, is is it, it's 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 a little backward step and a moment of reflection. So it's like that's how that's his formula. It's Ira Glass's formula. It's like anecdote, 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 and then reflect back. And what the does way this he mean? does it, but it means like okay, um, what does it mean? You know, and and so in a sense, what you were doing when you reflected back and you said, remember, we're not supposed to be judging these people. You know these these are these are kids and they're part of a sociological phenomenon that so happens to you know a wave that's sweeping through the minds of humanity right now you know yeah that's the backward step okay the step of reflection ira glass does it with the interview like he actually has a good skill of getting the the person being interviewed to make that reflective so that he doesn't have to do it in his voiceover you know yeah. he will do it if he thinks it's necessary but this is kind of what I try to advocate for my students is you can you can get someone to tell their story. But then what you want to try to do is lead them to do a little bit of that reflection themselves. You know, so why why do you think that happened? Yeah. What do you think it means? You know, kind of. And then what you might get is that they might connect it up to something that you never thought of, you know, or, or some something bigger that you never um, that you can that you find compelling or maybe complements what you had already suspected or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there's different forms. I I've done like six hundred interviews at this point. So um and I just I, I just throw myself into them. I don't take I don't bring any notes. I uh, you know I I do uh depends on how well I even know the person. Sometimes it's just I I saw a tweet and I had them on. I have no idea who I'm gonna be talking to or about what. Mm -hmm. Um but I just wonder if there are different forms. I'll have to consider that when i have more experience you know but there are there's a kind of a there's a wave form it's a feeling form when there's there's certain interviews where it doesn't doesn't go anywhere because the person doesn't want to go anywhere where we're, we're just staying on this one level where they're saying the things that they say and get attention for on twitter or whatever i'm like well what who who 
Are you, come on, come on. And then there's other people who, yeah. who are trying to tell a story, but the way that their brain works, it's like they're going back and forth and it's just like, okay, just, just tell me what you're talking about. Just slow down and tell me what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And so the interview skill is being kind of like this universal plug, trying to just be totally yeah. present and see if, if I can resonate with that and then see if the audience gets something out of that. And um, one, one a form, it, it's, kind, it's a little bit dicey to even kind of abstract from it because it's such a powerful story, but the detransition narrative, it, it's, it's got a very, I, I, I believe it probably even you could make it an archetypal form. You have some kid who gets into this, this idea in their head, um, you know, fueling they're, they're discomforted. Something happened to them or they're a little different. They can't make sense of the world. They get in their head that gender is the answer. The gender is the answer. They go through the process. And then there's always that moment where they look in the mirror or a voice comes in to their head and says, stop living a lie. And then they're like, fuck, you know, and then they, and then they go through the process of, of actually grappling with themselves and, and watching them coming out of that. It's a, it's, it's probably like a, like this, this kind of shape, uh, story, uh, but mm -hmm. they're all different, but they're all kind of the same as a form. Um, mm -hmm. and then they also That's have a political true. point, but I'm trying to get away from the political point because it's more about yeah. the human and the archetypal point. Right, right. Right. Yeah. They do seem to have a common kind of structure. I'd have to think about what exactly, because I think what you're getting at in those interviews are what I call, um, confessional truth. You know, so the testimonial truth is something that the community needs to know because it's important that they know it, you know. So that okay. would be, um, for example, I use an example of um, there's a, a documentary called um, Alive Inside. And it's about this guy who brings music into these old folks homes and basically uses music to get the to trigger their memory so that they can kind of like come back to life they're basically sort of vegetables and then yeah, they, yeah. they kind of come back to life because of music um and so that's testimonial so that's kind of like the world needs to know that this works you know same thing with um with um um life animated it's like the world needs to know we found a little miracle here and that's yeah. that these animated movies can help people that are having trouble processing reality because they're on the spectrum um, but test but confessional truth that is about self-knowledge and there's a long long history and this is what's so funny to me about when i started studying documentary was that people would wind up saying things in the interviews that they hadn't told their parents or they hadn't told their their close friends there's just some kind of a dynamic of someone actually listening to them you know yeah. and so i went back into the history of the confessional as a book genre going back to St. Augustine's Confessions um, and, and then kind of like up through up through history of this idea that in order for you, us as human beings to know ourselves, we have to have someone to bounce. We have to have a confessor in the Middle Ages. They would have the confessor and the, that's the monk would go to the to kind of a superior monk. And then they would. Yeah. It wasn't like confessing like bless me father for i've sinned kind of a confession but it was more like what we would think today of as therapy where it's kind of like talking through your life kind of a mentor mentee relationship you know yeah and in a world where there's nothing no place left in our culture for that kind of a of, a, of an interaction outside of maybe therapy you know yeah. but then you're paying for that and people you know they don't that's only for the rich kind of you know, and so these all of these filmmakers at Sundance would say when we do this forum that we would do where we would interview them, the the filmmakers and the subjects, and the subject would say it felt like therapy. It felt like therapy, you know, and and um, so there's something about self knowledge, like you know yourself better when you're talking through it with a with a a, a willing, you know, partner. It doesn't work to confess to yourself you know, like by yourself in, a, in your room, you know, it doesn't have the efficacy. Well, no, of, I would, one caveat would be the diary or the okay. autobiography. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Which, which, where you're speaking to anyone, where, where you're That's externalizing true. the thought through the process of writing. I think that That's that true. could fill a stop gap, even with the, right. um, with the idea that somebody somewhere might read this at some point might be prompt mm -hmm. enough yes. to open up. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. I think, yeah, it it does have a some kind of a implication that someone would read it, maybe, you yeah. know, or that your future self. Would read well, it. even that lock, which yeah. is saying don't read is saying 
there's I'm, I'm talking yeah. like it, it's yeah. a confession of, of being of speaking to someone well that's see that's the weird thing about the documentary as confession is that it doesn't have a lock <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's, it's really weird. Yeah, it's really weird. Like the 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 responsibility of being an interviewer, especially with very raw people or very broken people. Yes. It's like wow. Like, um, is it good um, that this is being broadcast, or is this so good that it has to be broadcast? This is this mm -hmm. is the outcome of something. This this human pain. And I guess that that that. That's the other question or the other side of media making. Um, one is exploitation and the other is propaganda. And, and I wonder if the tools that you are, uh, just the knowledge that you're gathering and, and formulating might, you know, might help people tell stories, might people make sense of their own lives, but also might give people clue, like I'm being lied to. This is propaganda. Or, this is something that's manipulating. This story is is a manipulative story or the, or there's a or there's even stories that i tell myself about the world you know conspiracy theories or something like that the toxic stories are stories that that in and of themselves become parasites on consciousness yeah there is definitely so, see what i i kind of advocate for a kind of like a almost a private code of ethics for the documentarian and i would extend it to the journalist maybe because there's a little bit of overlap you know but basically the idea is the difference between what i call like a generative or generous ethic and an exploitative ethic you know um and, and propaganda probably works in there somehow but like a good example i think of like the exploitative style it would be something like tiger king you know where huh. we're all just kind of laughing at them we're all just kind of thinking, God, you know, these people are ridiculous, you know, um, and everyone's kind of like commiserating, the, the, like the joy of it is all of us just thinking how terrible Carol Baskins is or whoever it was yeah. in, in that, you know, and I'm all, and I'm always kind of thinking, well, I, of all the examples going back through the history of documentary of documentaries that really transcended the generations, there was such a respect for the subjects you know there was this sense of not judging the subjects you know the the prime example yeah. is um gray gardens gray gardens from the mazels brothers made in 1975 you, 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 have you seen that one uh gray gardens i, I i've only I, I know i'm getting a poster in my head like about okay. two well, weird sisters i think there was a new yes. yorker piece about it or something yes it's it's crazy because not only was it they made the documentary in 1975 but it's been made into a broadway play um they spoofed it in documentary now with bill Hader. Yeah. um there is a drew barrymore movie a fictionalized version of it that was yeah. made well, she's got um, old makeup on i think right it, yeah like, yeah, yeah. Close or something yeah. so it, it it really struck a nerve you know it just it's just transcended the generations in terms of like spin-offs and yeah. things that have been created out of it, it's one of the most successful documentaries in the history of documentary film. And the one thing that those Maisel brothers will tell you, if you go back and look at their old interviews, is they'll say that they had respect and love for these two women. They were fascinated by these two women. They were living in squalor with fleas and just the house would catch on fire occasionally in an old dilapidated mansion in the Hamptons. And nobody you know nobody cared about them they just kind of were there and um and uh the, the Maisel's brothers were going to do a, a documentary about jackie kennedy and then they saw this article in the newspaper that said that jackie kennedy's cousin are going to cousin is going to get kicked out of the of the old mansion and she had to pay a bunch of money to kind of clean it up and so they thought that well that's a lot more interesting than jackie kennedy huh. and so they went there for a few weeks and just filmed their their lives and it's like this juxtaposition between high culture they're singing and you know um playing old records and talking about the, the you know the high life and then there's this also kind of a weird resentful relationship between the mother and the daughter big Edie and little Edie and then there's a sense that what that little Edie has a crush on David the sound the one for the brothers you know and it just it just and it just it's just fascinating to watch there's so much about what happens when a, a woman in high society is unable to marry 
Uh, you know, w- yeah. what about this? You know, she wanted to go to New York and become a singing star, but she couldn't leave her mother. But even though she hates the Hamptons, you know, all of these kind of like all of, all kinds of things that you could be thinking about while watching that. Yeah. But the one thing that they don't do is they just they don't make fun of them. You know, they just show who they are and they, yeah. they are quirky and weird, you know, and they do. But but it, somehow I feel like it just has a different um, essence than the Tiger King thing. Where, yeah. where it's almost like that's like you're looking for somebody with that quality of weirdness that so so that you can make it go viral or you can make it you know grab people's attention with it you know yeah yeah there's um i just wonder about the, that ethic like where where that ethic is coming from like I, I thought of the idea of like a god's eye view um but it's a very it would be a very particular god it would be a god that can sympathize and relax judgment but sees all and, but doesn't like let go of judgment It's still perceptive, very perceptive. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would guess the, the, like, I guess a counter example, maybe this is a question. What do you think about Michael Moore as a documentarian? Every documentarian hates Michael Moore. <laughs> <laughs> is that like the only way you can graduate from documentarian that's, class? That's it's the like official position. You have to re- yes. renounce Michael Moore like three times with the switch of sage or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. When I was in grad school, it was just like, oh, no, not Michael Moore. You know, we don't do what Michael Moore does, you know. Um, but not pay his, yeah. uh, his uh, crew of color or whatever, hire, hire uh, people oh, to respect us and then not pay him. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? what? Yeah. <laughs> but no, I think that he, he that's a, probably a pretty good example of more on the propaganda side. And, you know, you know it's very fascinating. Um, if you go and look, I don't know if it's still true, but if you look up the all time box office, highest grossing documentaries, there's two of them. And one of them's Michael Moore. And guess what the other one is? I, I who's, don't the, know. who's the guy? Dinesh D'Souza. D'Souza? Oh, really? Yes. Wait, was and it about like election like fraud or something? It, it, that no, one? it was, he made an, it was in, uh, just before Obama's second term yeah he made an anti-obama movie okay yeah okay so if you think about it okay the two highest grossing is one from the right and one from the left yeah of propaganda yeah. basically of propaganda and w- w- the relationship between the audience and being told what they want to hear right is, yeah. is a way and, to, to challenge an audience and to keep their attention like that is an art form in and of itself yes yes um so i i understand the appeal of let's just tell people what they want to hear and and let's just kind of get on the bandwagon of whatever side that you want to join it's almost like a legal suit documentary is legal Mm -hmm. suit right right like i'm going to prove a point i'm going to make a case yes yeah um there's there's one about the scientology going clear by um paul um what's his name HBO it was on HBO a few years ago. You yeah, know, it was that, that was another one where it's kind of like I'm going to show, you know, how the you know the, the problems with this organization. Yeah. Um, so I yeah I think that there is definitely an appeal to that, and and it's a way to monetize. It's 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 part of the larger game of monetizing attention these days, where outrage yeah. and you know my side bias type stuff is the easiest way to. To get that attention because you're kind of harnessing the lizard yeah. brain or whatever you yeah. and you get it in numbers you get big numbers with that either one side yeah. or the other yeah right right um but i think that the sort of task of the artist really is to like you said like do something that is going to uh not judge the audience but challenge the audience you know there's a, a kind of a line between maybe here's something that you need to know that you might not necessarily swallow um but i'm going to give it to you in such a way that you'll think it was your idea or something like that you know it's good for you but it, it it's uh um it's it's not going to be it's not going to be something that you just automatically assume what it is going in and then your, yeah. your assumptions are confirmed you know this isn't a well i guess it is a documentary but it's audio only there's a podcast about this oh man i can't remember the name of the podcast podcast um i listened to it uh, 2020 during the uh, lockdown um it's about this oh man i can't even remember what the plot was but 
you know, I think it was produced by Ira Glass or produced by NPR, and it was about some guy in some like hick town, and he's just oh, I, so. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, he's just um, so quirky. Um, I'll put it yeah, in the show. Like yeah, he built like a maze. Yeah, he built something, it, and it, yes. But like, but a, the thing is, the 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 whole it like it changed. Like your knowledge of him was changed so many different times over the course of that long form, you know, eight hour mm -hmm. experience. Like there were so many different turns in your understanding of that, which I think that turning, that turning, or that 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 going to a deeper level, deeper level, is one way to. Um, Without trying to fish for nuance, that's one way to upset upset the the drive for judgment, the drive to 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 answer the question that is being proposed by the documentary. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, because we all have the first impression, and the first impression is, you know, when someone meets me for the first time, they look at me and they think, well, this is how this this is what kind of a guy he is, and then as they get to know me, that's either confirmed or denied. You know. Um, and that's how we that's how we operate. It's low resolution, high resolution, you know. Yeah. And so that's narrative is perfect for creating a more high resolution picture of something. Um, even I'm even thinking of like uh, uh, the old TV show Lost, when at yeah. first you hate this guy named Sawyer, this character Sawyer. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then but over time you're like, yeah, he's not so bad. Like I kind of see where he's coming from. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And and that's that's what you can do with these with these kind of things. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, as long as you um so one way I broke down uh the job of the content creator which is just anybody who does anything related to content um is you have to catch attention, maintain attention, Th those are the basic. Well, okay. First and foremost, you have to ca capture attention, just influencer mm -hmm. stuff. Pay attention to me. Pay attention to this. Right. Put yourself between uh, the audience and the and the train wreck, or whatever. Like, or, or 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 be the train wreck yourself, and you get the attention. Then keeping the attention, you actually have to have some sort of substance there, or some sort of plot. You have to extend the attention. You have to go into why the train wreck is a train wreck, or you have to deliver a message, or you have to reveal a truth. You have to. That's where you're stepping away from just a basic influencer, just somebody who's uh, monetizing attention into somebody kind of providing something for the audience to stay around. But then, the, like, there's a third level, um, which is like the artist level and maybe it's pretentious maybe it's not to say that but like you're trying to m not manipulate attention but change attention so that somebody invests their interest into you and then they come away enriched or changed a little bit and if you can work on the level of just the way that you see things or the way that that's that's the amazing thing about longer form storytelling movies documentaries like uh when i was what 19 i watched uh, that movie blue the, like the, there's a three colors trilogy Yishowski. yeah and and after i watched blue like i like I was, I didn't know I could look at the world in the same way. Like everything just looked differently. He affected the way that I was seeing things. He affected my chain. Uh, he changed my attention. And that's like the, the Holy grail of, of, of art It's like you capture, you maintain, and then you, you gift like, or you give insight or something like that. Yeah. 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 No, I think, the, I think you're right. The, the gift, that's the most important part to me is that you, you're thinking of what you're doing as, fundamentally a gift you know and so that's the i think that's the mistake that at least young filmmakers make at first is that they focus you said cash attention and maintain attention that's in a lot of ways the hardest part because yeah. that's like everybody's getting their attention pulled all over the place you know um and they think that that's the goal is like once you have the attention there you've got it you've you you're successful but the gift part that's always what i'm trying to maintain is that if you really want for that attention to be worth people's time then there needs to be you need to think of of yourself as giving them a gift and what is the gift that you're giving them you know and it would be maybe different according to for like i was saying the different kinds of truths a confessional truth or a testimonial truth or a lament or a celebratory truth you know yeah. um here's the gift that i'm giving you you know um that there i don't know if you heard um i think i put it in one of my videos this guy gunter denning is an artist from europe and he does these things called stumbling stones so he would be operating what i call the lament space um 
and the gift that he's giving. So he, if you, I, I've started collecting every, I've seen him everywhere on the sidewalks of Europe, Amsterdam, Berlin, Paris, Budapest, all over the place. There's these little brass, um, they, he takes out one of the stones and puts this little brass thing in and it puts the name of the person who lived there when they were abducted during the Holocaust and when they died. Hmm. And they're just there. You'll see, and there'll be four or five of them because four or five people lived in that house. And you'll just walk through the streets of Europe and you'll see them everywhere. And he calls them the, it, the stumbling stone project, you know, and he doesn't do anything else. He doesn't try to make it, it. There's no like argument attached to it. There's no political point. It's, it's just remember this. Yeah. Remember this happened here, you know, and so that's the gift in to my way of thinking. it's like um he saw a need for us to never forget this and it's in the lament world and so he's giving this gift to the world by doing this this massive thing of digging up the sidewalk stones and replacing them with these little brass ones all over all over europe yeah yeah and and you what what's uh your teacher but you yeah. also create like what's well, your my day job i'm a camera guy you know so i work on movies um you know bigger movies as a, yeah. as a camera tech and then on the side i have my little documentary projects and book projects um so there's a, a little bit of an intellectual side which is the adjunct teaching occasionally book projects occasionally i i write in the field it's a very small field but the field of theology and film you know, um, it, it, it's it came out of, you know, one of my master's degrees. Th th okay. That's what I was studying. I was studying theology and film. So my little book on documentary is the first one that I'm aware of that really tried to tackle nonfiction film, nonfiction specifically in the world of theology and film. Um, and so then the, so the teaching kind of ties into that. But I, I don't like to do things just intellectually in a vacuum. I like to try to ground it into an actual practice. So. You know, if if I end up writing this book on the seven basic plots, which I'd like to do, um, it would be with the goal of trying to help people, not to just have an a, an intellectual theory about writing or story, but to yeah. really, I would hope, make people write better themselves or have better better creative projects themselves. Um, what's so that's the, my uh, second mountain. What's the uh, well? You might have more than one. Uh, just getting up that mountain, who knows? Um, but. <laughs> What, what's the relationship or how is theology uh, communicated or interacted with through film? Like what, what's something, how, how do we, how do we look at stories through a theological lens? What does that mean? Theological? Well, um, see that the, the field has really evolved a little bit. Um, there is a place in St. Andrews, Scotland, at the uh, University of St. Andrews called Center for Imagination, Theology, and the Arts. And that's where I was going to possibly do my PhD. I wound up getting my MFA here in L.A. instead because I could still work on movies. I didn't have to take off. Um, but I still formed a relationship with them while I was getting my master's here at Fuller. I wound up with a, a master's in philosophy, a master's in theology and art, and, a, and an MFA in art, you know, okay. because I'm I way over... I got addicted to uh, higher education. <laughs> um, but anyway, so while I was doing my theology and art here at Fuller, um, I was taking a class. You can you can petition to do uh, uh, basically give a professor over there a, a stipend, and you can take a class from that uh, a directed reading course basically. So I, I formed this relationship with the Institute for Theology, Imagination, and the Arts, and and their big thing is that your imagination is sort of colored by the religious foundation that you're standing upon. Okay. You know? yeah. um, so there's a book, a, a more famous book called um, The Catholic Imagination, which is about how your imagination is colored if, if you grew up in a Catholic environment. And then there's a book about that specifically related to film called After Image, which is about six American filmmakers only one of which is a practicing Catholic that has these themes within their work that you could only say are Catholic. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma, Alfred Hitchcock, Martin Scorsese. Scorsese. He would be the, yeah, he would be the only one that's would say he's a practicing Catholic. I think. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, who else did I say? Frank Capra, um, John Ford, maybe. Anyway, so six filmmakers. And it just goes through and it just kind of shows the nature of how redemption happens in the stories, a sacramental okay. reality within the stories, the the sense of, of, of how saints work, the characters as saints, you know. And so you could really say that someone could write a book about the Protestant imagination and look at Ingmar Bergman films, you know, or someone could write a book about the Orthodox imagination and look at Tarkovsky or something like that, you know. Yeah. Um, so... I think that there's a connection between the imagination and religion, basically, you know. Um, and so the, so you can kind of, you can it doesn't matter if you're religious or not. There's still a relationship, you know, like you, you can yeah. still kind of go into the world of religion. Friends of mine that are not religious will still go to Italy with me and they'll go into these cathedrals and they'll look at all the frescoes and everything. And they'll get very inspired by that, you know, and they'll be able to see the same patterns that I'm seeing you know, yeah. even though they may not be practicing. And so I think that um, there's a real, oh, and another great group to look at are the Mexican filmmakers that have been winning Academy Awards over the past 10 years. Alfonso Caron, um, uh, Iñárritu, um, you know, that sort of cohort, you know, Shape of Water, Gravity, um, Babel, you know, all of those films that were kind of really, um, what's the yeah. one with Sean Penn? Um, uh, 21 six, Grams. Yeah, 21 Grams, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, if you, oh, um, Guillermo del Toro will talk openly about how the images of the Catholic Church influenced him. And so when you when you want to understand what the shape of water means, you need to take into account this sense that he had of how the even though he doesn't consciously believe anymore in Catholicism, how that still colors his work and influences work. And, and this is he'll even admit to that you know so i think that there's a there's a it's a it's like a a porous relationship between the two you know you can kind of go back and forth they kind of uh relate to each other in a lot of ways yeah um i was uh when i was at evergreen i took one course and we were going through colonial literature and i got handed a story to do a uh, report on i think it was one of the first like lost on an island stories and it was one of the very first lost on an island stories from from britain and it was just it was just dripping with biblical references and i tried to like bring that up in class and no none of the kids had read the bible at all i'm like if you don't know what you're seeing you don't know what you're seeing you don't know what you're acting out like the the um you you said uh earlier about um not being able to end if you don't integrate the darkness so called then um it'll kind of come out one way or another but if you don't if you're not aware of your heritage you don't know what you're acting out at all you just you don't know what you're acting out and i don't even know if you can see yourself um for how you're acting that it seems like there's such a blind spot not only from the past um but you know into the present because of because of that lack of um coherence or something and and if you look at the if insofar as i do do social commentary on america and just thinking in terms of like where are we at now as empire what are our great cathedrals what is this civil rights thing how did it go so wonky how did it get so intense and fundamental and um you know thinking about progressivism and liberalism and and uh it's really difficult not to see them as a, a strain of christian religion and it's really hard to not see them as a protestant uh, you know, just a marching forward of the Protestant project in a way. And, and it's, I guess I bring that up because, uh oh, oh, sorry. I got to change my battery. Oh, okay. I'll just finish <laughs> my, second. my word. Yeah, finish your thought. It's just, uh, when telling a story about society, it's, uh, I'm kind of like driven by, you know, interest and, and boredom too like if if i'm just saying the same thing over and over again if i'm hearing the same critique over and over again that tells me that something's not 
true. Even, even if it's accurate, it just loses truth. Like uh, the way that we're making sense of the world and, um, the way that politics is shifting out, um, or shaking out. It's like, well, where's the energy in, in politics? Where's the creative spark? Where, where are the people who are really starting to do something, you know, like you can feel that, that feeling and stuff like that. And, and so using and being aware of storytelling or, or political commentary as storytelling, and then also relying on, you brought up the word imagination. I don't know what that means, but curiosity mixed with excitement or something, um, this curious variation interaction between me and my environment that that's exciting. Um, that kind of guides me too. Like my, my hunger and my thirst more than just like, I, I don't want to know the truth and I don't want to pronounce a, a uh, like the final theory of where we are and how we get out of it. It's like, well, where, where's the cool, where's the cool stuff going on? Where's the weird stuff going on? Yeah. It, it, I think you've talked to Jonathan Peugeot a lot. So it, you've, you, you know about the idea of the symbolic thinking, you know, yeah. or some symbol, symbolic world. To me, that's what helps you understand the time that you're in is to see the symbolic pattern playing it out like a, like a narrative yeah. playing out you know and i th i just think that it might have something to do with the ian McGill gilchrist notion of the two sides of the brain you know right and left brain and that the it's the right brain somehow your dreams your imagination your creativity you know and and whatever it is that makes you embody a certain pattern you know, like you find yourself actually living out a certain pattern, yeah. you know, a certain archetypal pattern or something, either destructive or not destructive, you know, either positive or negative. Um, and so, yeah, so so that's the arts kind of they go in that direction, you know. Um, and so I think it just it helps. Grant. Here's an example. Um, there was a, a buddy of mine who went through a bad breakup and he tells the story of how the movie sideways saved him <laughs> and he just was depressed and he was sitting on his couch and he was doing anything, but he just, something grabbed him about that movie and he watched it like 50 times or something. Mm -hmm. You know, he just watched it over and over and over. And he, he went from being miles who's the destructive character played by, or no, um, uh, Thomas Hayden church, the destructive character, uh, that's kind of reckless and just hedonistic and reckless. And then he went to being Miles, who's the the more kind of like depressed, but more sophisticated, but huh. yet alcoholic friend in the yeah. movie. And then by the end of it, Miles barely, barely just kind of goes out the, finally gets to the other side and just hinted at in the in the movie. It, it doesn't show that yeah. he has a relationship with Maya, the, um, the, the love interest in it, but there's just this one little voice message at the end of the movie um, that kind of implies that he's he's kind of made it through this dark period, you know? Yeah. And somehow, um, watching it that many times did something to his brain that enabled him to kind of pull out of his his depression after this, this breakup, you know? So I, I, yeah. I think that there's, somehow there's some kind of wisdom about not not just like that's on the individual level, obviously, but on the cultural level too. Like where we are as a culture, are we all kind of sitting on the couch depressed after a breakup as a culture, you know, like yeah. he was, you know, and would watching this movie fifty times work for us too, you know? I don't yeah. know. Well, I don't know if the Avengers changed the world. It kind of went to crap after the End Game uh, uh, film came well, out, but we all watched it at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, the art world always gives me a lot of hope. Um, you know, you're on Twitter a lot, and I, I, I'm barely ever on Twitter because I just, I just get so depressed. Oh, Twitter. really? <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. And I, I find, you know, it just, I find that the more news I consume, and the more kind of like that that uh, stream of 24 hour news stuff and right yeah. and left narratives and all that kind of stuff, it just my creative energy just goes down you know and so i really try to limit as much of that like i'm i'm kind of want to do an experiment of how little news i could consume and still get by you know like yeah like what do i actually need to know that i wouldn't get told by somebody you know like like what do i really really like could i make it like let's say six months without <laughs> hearing any news what would happen you know like i don't know yeah 
Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I tried it. I've had a developmental arc with that, um, that application or that website or whatever that thing is that Twitter is. And I feel like it's a balance, but I guess it could be wasting my time. But if I feel, if it's making me feel bad, I'd, I change the way that I engage with it. I don't engage with it less. I just change the way that I engage with it. I, I use it as a place to piss people off or dick around or put sentences together. Like, Oh, I have a sentence and then just leave it there. Like, here's a sentence. Yeah. Cause I just like sentences, yeah. you know? Right. Um, but then it's no, also it's a, great it's for, skill. for networking too. Like I found right. you somehow do it. So, right. You know, well, you I found me. Little, I yeah. wasn't even, I you weren't even on there. A year since I'd been on Twitter. <laughs> really? How did you? How did yeah. you find my little shout well, out then? Because Paul Vanderclay. Um, oh, he called you out. He said, "Oh, I mentioned you on Twitter or something," and so, or what? No, somebody sent me an email and said, "I don't know what I don't." And I was like, "Oh, I should t check my Twitter." You know. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then I found this little thread of you guys like trying to figure out who I was. <laughs> yeah. Who's this guy? This is great stuff. <laughs> And speaking of it, of which, so what's, what's your plan for your channel? Like what's the, the spiel is you're, you're teaching documentary, you're teaching storytelling. What, where are you at? Where, where are you headed? What are you building through it on you? Well, I was kind of inspired a little bit by Paul Vanderclay because um, he basically kind of convinced me that this is a medium that can work for kind of like deeper long form stuff, you know? And so like I said, initially, it was just I wanted to dump a place where I could dump my lectures yeah, that I could give to my students when they missed a class. Um, but then as I started to go through the seven basic plots, I was going back and forth between should I just pitch it as a class and then teach it and then write a book about it? Or should I use YouTube to kind of work out my ideas and have a, a way to kind of see if it what people think of it, which would kind of like save me a little bit of time in developing it into a class or or writing a book about it you know so right now my plan is to just keep going through the seven basic plots yeah. maybe um i'm gonna probably there's a guy here local who uh, runs a story hour and he he does a lot he has a lot of thoughts about narrative and story i might do an interview with him you know um but basically yeah it's it's mostly just for me to kind of work through these ideas about narrative and story documentary too maybe a little bit um and um and then just kind of see see where that goes you know see if it's helpful for people and yeah. yeah and what about uh something that's not pedagogical or pedagogy centered or do you have a documentary that you you have in your future well, <laughs> yes uh i i, I don't want to say Noodles? too early what okay I, what i'm <laughs> um but I, I have two documentary projects that I'm trying to finish in. And, okay, and this, this is a, also another thing to think about right now is where the streaming services are fitting into all this and whether or not releasing something like you did of a long form documentary in episode, an episodic type of a thing um, on YouTube, rather than trying to go to Amazon or trying to, to go to Netflix. Yeah. There's a real hurdle that I've run into with, um, independent documentary and it has to do with this thing called eno insurance errors and omission insurance oh. it's very hard to, to get and you have to have all of your ducks in a row you have to have all of your permissions you have to have location um permissions and you have to have signed releases from every person in the in the film and unless and, and 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 you have to have a lawyer go through even if it's public domain stuff the lawyer has to sign off on every single clip in that documentary yeah. and so there's a real budgetary kind of line there so that if you can't afford a lawyer to go through that and you don't really have a pretty like when i called the eno insurance place for my little urban planning documentary that i'm i'm working on um they said well once you get like a a bigger producer that's not you you know because i'm not really a producer I'm just a yeah. camera guy um then call us back you know kind of a thing oh, so, they so i thought huh. hmm so, so you, you have to raise some money to get it on Netflix, basically, yeah, you know, yeah. um, and maybe it, like if you went to Sundance Film Festival and, and it won, then they, they might do something where they partner with you to kind of put you over the top with the Sundance Institute. They do stuff like that. There are organizations that do stuff like that, you know, um, yeah, yeah. but, but I almost wonder, you know, like, is there a value in using uh, one of these other 
mediums like YouTube um, to put out to put the stuff out and you might be able to get just as many people benefiting from it or or yeah. watching it or enjoying it as you would on one of these other platforms. Um, so, so yeah, yeah the, you know, the, I, I, the professional yeah. world and the amateur world, like I'm from the amateur world, so I don't have to worry about all that professional stuff, but knowing somebody in the professional world, they're like, uh, how do I go to the amateur world? But do I really want to do, it's this really yeah. interesting intersection. We'll see how it develops in the future. I know that they would never be able, well, it would be a total pain in the ass to ter- take the evergreen story and put it on Netflix or Amazon because the amount of found footage without any sort of release yeah. forms attached to it, it's like, nobody's going to want to yeah. touch that. Um, but it's all found. So it's Creative Commons copyright. But uh, mm-hmm. if, if big money starts getting involved in it, then I don't know how all that lawyer stuff or anything like that. It, happens, they, so. The only thing they want is the liability to go to the E&O insurance company. So basically, yeah. they're the ones who take care of that. And, and the E&O people, they don't care. They like, you need to have this, this and this. Yeah. Otherwise, we won't insure it. And yeah. you're like, OK, well, can you make an exception? And they're like, no. <laughs> interesting yeah interesting oh, it, it, it really is a hurdle yeah 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 we'll see how the, the industry shakes out with amateur um content becoming increasingly easy to create and not to mention the ai stuff that's coming out that looks pretty phenomenal like adobe adobe's coming out with something where you just start typing into the prompt and it makes the movie for you it even generates the script for you it goes finds the b-roll for you it's just crazy so we'll right. see how that ends oh up shaking gosh. out with the future yeah it's going to be about curation more than it is going to be about, you know, because in the in the past where it was like you had to Take afford care. a 16 millimeter camera or something yeah. like that. There's a certain thing. And and so there's only so many people that are actually making anything. Now, I think like someone like yourself, you're kind of a, taking on the role of a curator in a way, you know, because what you choose to showcase is based on the relationship that people form with you to be, well, he's he's got interesting tastes, the same as mine or something like that. And yeah. so I'm gonna watch what he puts out, you know? Um, yeah. So that might be the real key in the future, not not the gatekeepers. You know, well, I mean, that's, that's even working out with, um, we'll see that in journalism. Uh, you can't trust the New York Times, the Washington Post, Fox News, you can't trust these organizations, but you do nevertheless get uh, attached to individuals within those organizations. You form relationships. That's how Barry Weiss and Mike, uh, Matt Taibbi have been able to be so successful because people trust them. And so they, yes. they're, they're beyond the institution in a certain way. And, um, you know, with whatever's going to happen with Tucker Carlson, it's going to be fascinating to see if he goes independent or goes to another channel. But if he goes independent, yeah. like Joe Rogan, he could, he could, pretty much give the lie to the institutional authority, the institutional cachet uh, for all of journalism, if, if he pulls it out, potentially. And and uh, I know people have different uh, opinions of Tucker, but he is very talented and he's very popular. So that's going to be a big shakeup, too, if he goes independent or something like that. I don't, I don't expect him to open a YouTube channel, but maybe, who knows? <laughs> or maybe he'll do the Spotify thing like Joe Rogan did or something yeah, like that. No, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. So where can people find you? I'll put it in the description. You don't use Twitter. Do you have a place where your well, writing I, is kept? I'm No, I'm on Twitter now. Okay. I won't yeah. go on there occasionally. Okay. Looking for um, news or trying not to but, look for news? No, I mean, I would say, um, you know, my, my, my ruminations on story are my, from my YouTube channel. Um, my... JustinWellsFilms.com is my website. That's where I kind of, that's where you can get my little book. And, you know, I, I've, I've, um, you know, I kind of update what I'm, what I'm working on there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, I, I guess there you post Twitter, YouTube and, and my, <laughs> and my website. <laughs> well, Justin, your, your work is really interesting. It is really fun filling a niche and it was really a, just a pleasure to stumble upon uh so i, I really encourage you to keep on uh keep at it because it's great stuff and i know my audience is going to love uh learning through uh your expertise about storytelling oh, yeah. well th- yeah thanks for thanks for uh, reaching out to me i really really enjoyed it and and i think um you know you're you're filling a niche, niche as well you know you're really um i think you're doing a lot of uh, a, a lot for people that probably more than you know you're, you just you, I mean, you let it go. You generate the content. You let it go and go into the next thing. <laughs> well, you just, I mean, you just have a respect for, <laughs> um, you know, for the, for the truth and for the people that you interview. And you know, I think people can 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 tell. You know, good. 
Well, I hope they can tell right now as I sign off. Thank you very much, Justin, for your afternoon. Yeah. Hopefully we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. I, you never answered my question about theology, but we'll, we'll have to save that for another episode. Oh, sure. I'm happy to talk about theology anytime you want. <laughs>